Well, welcome everyone. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good night. From wherever you are joining us, I would trust you well. Let me describe just how wonderful it is to have you join us in this space. And uh, it is indeed a delight. So we anticipate others joining in. And I wanted to just uh, introduce myself. I'm Kelvin Chambliss, along with my wife, Brenda, uh, who are co-hosting with Anderson Williams, what is known now as the Global Kingdom Conversation. And uh, you'll be hearing from Anderson shortly. This promises to be a real good time today. So we uh, also have uh, with us our collaborative uh, core team. And you're gonna be receiving some information this afternoon about uh, these uh, the gentlemen. Uh, we have Frederick Tobin out of the UK and we have Tim Kurtz uh, from here in the States, South Central Michigan and Ivan Gonzalez, who is located in Northwest Indiana, also here in the States. We also have Charles Opeo, uh, based in Kenya, beautiful community out there in uh, the Cyrus community in Kenya. And so uh, we're so uh, pleased to have uh, Charles to uh, be participating uh, with us on this, uh, on this team and on this call. Also, David Castro, who uh, Andy has coined our cable on this uh, call. And we are really grateful to have David, who has uh, experience over four decades. Uh, with the kingdom and he has a basis of operation, I think between Texas and South America, if I'm not mistaken. So, and then of course, Anderson Williams, uh, who is no stranger to us and uh, who has the, the, real, the, the real vision and the birth of uh, this call for, uh, for us gathering together who, who received that call, Anderson Williams. So he operates out of New York and Trinidad and, um, and then Brenda and I are here in Los Angeles. So those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to the Global Kingdom Conversation. And we consider this, as we say all the time, a provocative portal. The object of this platform is to provide leaders with a certain level of foresight, clarity, and where we speak wisdom among the mature. So uh, the purpose of this conversation is not to bring things up over and over again, like we're regurgitating them, familiar things, but to provoke us to think. That's a real big driver for us, provoking us to think. And there may be things that we may have entertained and thought before, but have never taken a deep dive into. So we hope that this becomes a place where that can occur for you. Sometimes we classify this as a hard hat zone and you picture a construction site where people are forbidden to enter areas without a hard hat. We don't expect hard articles to fall on you while on the call, but uh, there are things that we talk about that uh, challenge the status quo and that line of thinking. And so uh, those are things that we want you to also prepare for in case they do occur. So sometimes uh, there are doctrinal issues that are not aligned with the word of God that we have to address, and we do. And so it's just great to have a place where that can be done. So we want you to think, participate. We want you to contribute. Uh, we wanna move away from the talk shop model that you'll see today and listen and absorb and walk away, you know, with something more than just a presentation. So we also try to do our best to steer clear of persons who wanna inundate the conversation um, without listening and receiving the wisdom that is presented on this call by those who are sharing. So uh, if you're ready tonight, today, this morning, whenever you're listening, let's prepare to be challenged, to be stretched and even grow. So I wanna to present to you our dear friend, Anderson Williams, who will lead us further in this conversation. Good morning, Andy, the mic is yours. I think you may be on mute, Andy. Okay, Andy's experiencing te technical difficulties on his end, and uh, we're going to give him a second to reset. So bear with us, if you will. Are you all hearing me? Yes, you can be heard, Andy. Good, guys. Well, good evening, everyone. I don't know what's going on. I think that um, <coughs> it could be <coughs> issues on my iPad that does suddenly seem to give problems whenever we have to get started here. Well, um, guys, what we are attempting to do today on this call is to move away from what we um, have been doing for the last couple of months, um, where 
one person speaks and um, at the end we have some little interaction. Uh, I'll tell you this, uh, we have absolutely nothing planned today in terms of a, of a real nice structured format and we're doing this deliberately. This session is completely ad lib. What we wanna do is to have a conversation among ourselves. We're gonna um, use the, the current collaborative team as, the, as a panel and um, we will ask questions among ourselves. And at the same time, we will open up for you to ask questions as well. <clears throat> what are we aiming to, to get done here? Most of us on this call <laughs> um, have found ourselves in a very unique uh, place of journeying. Uh, you are deep inside, some of you are deep inside of the trenches of religion, uh, whether you admit it or you don't admit it. Some of you are pastoring churches where you are required to follow particular um, church protocols. And maybe some of you are inside of denominations where you have constitutions to subscribe to. And then you jump on platforms like these, or you might be exposed to um, maybe a PDF, you might be exposed to an audio file, maybe you jumped on a podcast and you were provoked to begin to think differently. And more you are provoked, you are being almost confronted by truth that puts that put a demand on you to make critical changes. But then you ask yourself, how do I make those changes? Um, here I am, I'm hearing concepts, but how do I put one foot in front of the other in order to initiate changes within my own life that I believe God um, requires of me? And how do I find myself in a new place that I believe God wants to wants me to exist out of. Um, what we're gonna do today is just basically um, talk around that particular theme and maybe along the way we might in, might in fact address other areas and discover other things along the way. Um, as I said, I'm gonna use several persons on the call. Charles O'Pierre is on the call. I'm gonna direct questions to him. And you know what? We just gonna have almost like in Trinidad, there's something we call a lime. Let me introduce it to Trinidad Palace. And the concept of a line came out in the days uh, just uh, pre-colonialism. What happened is that uh, the sailors would be on the ship and they were introduced to Caribbean rum. And on the ship, they would be drinking the rum and they would normally mix the rum with lime. And in doing so, a lot of <clears throat> the time was occupied drinking this rum and lime and they were no longer getting their work done. In order, for, in order for them to be more productive, the captain of the ship came up with the idea of allocating a period of time where these guys could drink their rum and their lime and it was known as liming. So today, all over Trinidad, people have this thing where they just lime. What is lime? After work, they sit up, they sit down, they have a drink and they have a talk and they just chill and it's just a nice banter back and forth. So what I've just done is given you a little bit of insight into Trinidad colloquialism and at the same time, creating a nice context where we could lime. So today we are liming, but we don't have the alcohol and we don't have the lime. What we have is a, a kind of very open kind of environment to just have a discussion. So let me just give you one particular one slide, and this will inform a lot of what we're gonna do. Here's a nice little Jewish proverb. What is truer than truth? It's your story. That's a nice Jewish proverb. What is truer than truth? It's your story. So what we want is to hear the story of guys on this call today. Let me hear your story. How did you make the jump? And in hearing these stories, I want you to more or less um, cast your almost as a participant in these stories and see how another person's story could provoke you to make some critical decisions. Along the way, while I may ask questions and others may ask questions from the existing collaborative team, you are equally allowed to ask questions. And so we will create a format, a context where, or create room for you to ask questions. You could either direct the question to the entire panel or you can direct it to any individual on the panel. And um, 
keep your questions in the context in which we are having this discussion today. So one simple little proverb, what is truer than truth? It's your story. So let's hear individual stories. And let me give you another proverb, not, not, not proverb. These are just three or four little slides I put together to at least contextualize what we're gonna do. So we're gonna hear our story. Second slide that I want you to look at is contemplation is as critical as execution. And that's important because some of us maybe are yet to make that radical first step, maybe in making changes in how your church is built, how things are constructed. You have not made that radical first step that everybody could notice and applaud. And sometimes in, in, in failing to make that step that everybody could see and everybody could notice and maybe somebody can say that you are now stepping more powerful into the kingdom, you've not yet made that step. You feel almost like, well, am I making the right decisions because I've not yet made that step that everybody wants me to make? Listen, sometimes contemplation, sitting and thinking, sitting and considering, sitting and having conversations with other people. Because at the end of the day, what the kingdom requires of you is not a reckless launch into something. What the kingdom requires of you is making a step in such a way that you are engaged in a long-term process, not a reckless, hasty exercise today that is not sustainable a week from now. And so thoughtfulness is critical to the exercise. So there's a very important principle to understand contemplation is as critical as execution. Don't feel condemned and don't allow anybody to condemn you if you've not made that big step that everyone can see. You know, just be very careful because the way I describe it, even when you know what you need to do, very often tiptoeing through the tulips is a far more correct way to do it than being a bull in a china shop. Tiptoe into the next phase of your purpose in that way, you, you more or less kind of cancel out big mistakes, big errors, reckless, man, reckless operations. So tiptoe into purpose as opposed to assuming bull in a china shop mentality. Third quote, third principle. In times of critical change, we have to be careful of the Rasputins. Rasputin was a, a Russian um, charlatan who had the the authority and he had incredible incredible ability and charisma and he had abilities with words he knows how he knew how to use his words but the man was a crook uh, history said that rasputin was able to get the air of the of the czar the czar was the king and in whispering in the air of the king utilizing his charisma he was able to take the king of course lead him of course and so today, Rasputin is almost like a trigger concept to describe people that you lend your ear to who are very, very capable of leading you, of course. In times of critical decision, in times of critical change, you have to be careful about who is whispering in your ear, who has access to your ear, who has access to your mind, whom you lend your ear to very often will determine the outcomes of your movement. And so on this platform, the guys that we have on this platform and who we are allowing to speak today, I am very confident that none of these are charlatans who will be whispering in your ear, leading you down a path that is not profitable to you. But it's a very important principle in times of critical change. And you could, use, you could change the word change and add all kinds of other words there in times of critical decisions. When life has come to this, very important inflection point. You have to be careful of the Rasputins, whom you lend your air to, who you're allowed to speak to you. The final quote that I'm gonna leave with you today, and um, then we're gonna jump into the talk is this. I call this the spiritual Shawshank Redemption Theory. The spiritual Shawshank Redemption Theory. What is the Shawshank Redemption Theory? For all of us, you have to know how to slowly dig your way out of your prison, one, rock hammer blow at a time. Very often, movement out of your prison cell is not always this massive jailbreak. Very often, it's an incremental process. The Shawshank Redemption theory is 
every single day you make one little chip, a little chip at a time. It took this guy in the movie two years to eventually exit. But every single day, he was constantly engaged in the rock hammer exercise. You see, some of us may be in organizations, maybe in systems. Maybe you are not even in a system, but your mind is held captive. Because listen, a lot of people are out there. They are free, but they are still held in chains. And those chains are all, they come in all kinds of different ways. Culture, they come by education, the color of your skin, the nation that you live in, the circle of friends that you have, all of them contribute to the links in your chain. And so while you are free, you are still held in chains. But to be, to be brought to a place of absolute freedom, very often you have to apply the spiritual Shawshank Redemption theory. Slowly dig your way out of your prison one rock hammer blow at a time. We are hoping that in today's discussion, totally ad lib, that we can at least help um, apply a little rock hammer blow to your process so that you could find yourself out of whatever prison you are currently held in, in a place where you are more free to execute the purpose of God in your own life. So on that note, let me introduce all the guys here. I would have done it, to, I would have done it before. They are the usual suspects. We have Charles Opio out of um, Nairobi, Kenya. Um, we have, uh, hold on, I'm seeing something that popped up there. We have uh, um, um, uh, Frederick Tobin. We have uh, Ivan Gonzalez. He's also on this discussion. Um, we also have, uh, uh, um, oh, my brain just seemed to be going, David Castro. David Castro is also on this talk. And we also ha have uh, um, Kelvin Chambliss would participate as well as Ivan Gonzalez. But listen, don't feel as though these are the only person you could talk to. I might very well take the conversation beyond <clears throat> this group and ask a couple more people about their own process. So let me start by, by throwing, um, putting Charles on the hot seat. Charles Opio, you could um, unmute your mic. Let me put you on the hot seat. You, you're going first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do. Okay. <laughs> going first is always all right. You're going no, first, Charles. Right. What, what, so, Charles, welcome to Hard Talk. It's good to, to have okay. you on Hard Talk. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask okay. you. Um, yeah. Ask you. you have one of the most unusual um, church. I, I'm going to use the word church conveniently. The most unusual church. As a matter of fact, when I first met you, it was called Church Unusual. Um, mm -hmm. what, would have, what would have brought about um, church unusual, but before you get there, remember I said the Jewish proverb, what is true and truth is your story. What is the path you took or the journey that you had to make that allowed you to throw off a lot of the vestiges of religion, a lot of the religious trappings and religious strongholds and religious mindsets? What were some of the unique pathways that you had to take that eventually led to you starting this initiative that was not church. It is not the traditional concept of church. Church unusual, and to date is um, having influence beyond Kenya and other areas. But tell us about your journey, tell us about your story, and tell us about church unusual, how you got there. OK, well, <laughs> I'll try and compress and stay with the core issues. I guess it, it, all, it all begins where I think it begins with most of us, with, with a desire to to function at a certain level within the things of God. I was brought up in the Baptist church, so very strong on Bible and Bible study and that level of theology and all that background. Then moved on to the Pentecostal season, you know, the, we all had a bit of that, the speaking in the tongues, the healings, then the word of faith movement. So it was almost like a, a journey, always asking for more. And like every time I did that, God had another door open to get into that until we got into the context of what we call the apostolic reformation. And it, for me, that was like, we have arrived. We're finally there. This is where we were going. At least I thought so then. And um, what began as a promise to break away from every, every season basically had its value. But as we went on, we'd see where excesses would come in and people would go off on a tangent. And I still remember one of the most uh, primal concepts at the, at the outset when we got into the apostolic reformation was the concept of the margin of error. Two major concepts I live with, the margin of error and the Noah principle. 
powerful concepts. One that says that, you know what, if you go two degrees off course, given enough time, you land in a different destination from where you're going. And that became pretty much the story of what had been happening for a while. So I kind of began to say, look, Lord, help me see when the margin begins to emerge, so to speak, so do not get off course on what's happening. And the no principle, the idea that God will use an ark to preserve a certain reality, but when the reality is realized, the ark has no value. And mm -hmm. Therefore, we move on to the next concept. Now, suddenly in the apostolic reformation, we found ourselves where it seems that we were moving to the end of the use of the ark, but nobody wanted to leave abandon ship. Wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nobody wanted to abandon ship because we wanted to be that exclusive, that, uh, um, what would I say? We had special revelation or the cutting edge of truth. We were basically above everybody else and everybody needed to get with the program, so to speak. And, and within that context, something began to happen. We began to pull back little nuances of stuff we said we wouldn't do. We began to literally uh, move an apostolic network into a mega denomination. Mm -hmm. it, it was almost like strategically, we were basically going back on our word because it almost seemed like we were against what we didn't have, but now that we have it, we need to defend it. Wow, yeah. So, so yeah. that became a major frustration for me. And then we began to um, change goalposts. The very things we said we wouldn't do, the very things we said we will not engage in became a reality and we began to literally create a mega system almost with a pop at the head. In that context, and that began to frustrate uh, realities. We had said that we were going to have uh, what I called, what we called um, autonomous relationships, where we come in by relationship, not by organization. Then we began to build an organization. We began to put back the very things that we, 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 we rebuilt hierarchy again. And I got pretty frustrated. Eventually, I walked away. But I guess the disillusionment was when you walk away with all this profound revelation and everything you're walking away to seems to be nothing. Because mm. suddenly every space you're going into, you've got this concept of, of we had the answers, so nobody else does. It was a kind of new wilderness, so to speak. Mm -hmm. a, a, a wilderness where you supposedly have insight, but that insight doesn't seem to be developing into anything. And, and it took a while because in the days of the so-called reformation, we burnt bridges, we lost friends. We mm -hmm. got a lot of stuff that we shouldn't have, but in the name of you're either with us or you're out the window, so to speak. Now mm -hmm. coming out of that, it took a real journey with God. I, I remember literally walking into another context of apostolic relationships and then, but that season brought some healing, but still there were certain nuances that remained. Mm. And then that, that, that was frustrating because it was almost like the, the, the greater God responds to this reality, the more we fall back to old models. Mm. So, so that became difficult. And I remember being disillusioned, my wife will tell you, and I said, look, I'm done with this. Fortunately, along this path, I had had this, what I then thought was a schizophrenic <laughs> functionality. I always had one leg that was in what would be called the marketplace in terms of consultancy and business and so on. And I kind of began to build up on that. And that, that became like a, an escape from this whole environment. And I literally said to God, look, I'm done with this. Let me just love you. Let me just be good at what me and you do. And I'm almost in frustration like Joshua as for me and my family. <laughs> we will serve the Lord and everybody else whatever you want to be. And, and I think it's in that moment that I had some amazing uh, interactions with God. I think I shared with you, Andy, the time when my wife and I were away for almost uh, three months, just in prayer, yeah. frustrated, asking mm -hmm. God, there's got to be more than this. And it's yeah. in that window that God gave me a very interesting word. He said, you know what? I, I know you don't want church anymore. And you know what? We are on the same boat. I don't want it either. That was a shocker for me. You know, I said, okay, then, then what? He said, well, 
What I want, if you're willing to go down that road with me, we'll be able to build something that's completely different. And you're not alone. There's more people like me. If you'll allow me, I'll allow you to get this, but I have to give you a completely new blueprint. So off of that, then God, of course, began, I began to go back into terms we had used loosely, like the ecclesia, like kingdom communities, and so on. Now, off of that, God said something to me because I was frustrated. As I came back into beginning to speak, part of my frustration was our level of revelation that didn't seem to have outcomes. I mean, we had a profound revelation, but we built nothing. So mm. to speak, that was a frustration. So God said, I'll explain to you how it works. And the scripture that God used, if somebody was to ask me, what's my inflection point? A very odd scripture in Malachi, Malachi 2.7. God, it says, the priest is given to knowledge, and I'm paraphrasing, but the people are given to instruction. And God mm. said, look, the problem I have with your generation is you're trying to replicate priests. Mm. So what yeah. you're doing, your teaching is just recreating yourself. You're not building kingdom communities. So the idea was, I'll give you knowledge, but you give people instruction. Don't give them knowledge. Mm. And that was, for me, my watershed moment. And God said, that means you're going to water down what you say, and you're going to become outcome-based, meaning people must pick an instruction no matter what you say, something they can do, something they can build into, something that can form a reality. And so uh, God began to give us wisdom. The reason I use the term church Unusual is because even though I knew we had to divorce the concept of church, the problem was people are so, I mean, you don't know Africa, the term church, we are still trying to price the lid off of that. Using mm -hmm. the term ecclesia, even when people say ecclesia, they mean church, if you don't know what I mean. Yeah. So it's hard to use a, a kind of a, a term that sounds familiar but leads us elsewhere. So we call ourselves church unusual. It gave us a number of advantages. One advantage, the term unusual allowed us to do weird stuff. <laughs> so, so for example, we were able to meet on a Wednesday night at 8 p.m. with no opening worship and praise and music and so on. And so it took time for that to take on. And God gave us favor in that window. Suddenly we got access to TV and we were on one of our national channels every week. And this kind of suddenly began to spread what we were doing and God literally caused that to blow out. And, and so suddenly church unusual became people's church, quote unquote. We discovered a lot of people had walked away from church, but still wanted God. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a very interesting scenario. So from that concept, it, it, it's like suddenly from that context, people began to really pick up. And then, of course, in that window, we eventually shifted. I mean, we just grew. We outgrew the place where we were. We had to move to a, a larger space. And then eventually, prior to COVID, God began to tell us to go online. So mm -hmm. we went online. We, we, we bought in cameras. We began a few more channels opened up. Really, God's given us favor with media. So we've mm -hmm. been able to get into quite a bit of television around our region and so on. And when we went online, it's like the numbers grew. So much so that post COVID, we couldn't go back to physical meetings. We'd be cutting out our whole community. Right, right, right. So mm -hmm. now we'd have to, we had to revamp and begin to have, so, so we broke down into components that could be worked on, different aspects which we've listed. I'm sure the document will go out on what we do. But off of that, we began to have like, more focused impact per group. So if we do have a face-to-face -face meeting, it's with a specific group of people with specific direction with outcomes we're looking for. Beautiful. So that became our, our, our base. So I guess in a nutshell, that would be where this came out of. Beautiful. Let me, let me um, before, before I jump to David Castro, I'm gonna, um, that's almost like um, telling David to ready himself. And let me ask you a couple of questions, Charles. Um, yes. you, you talked about the, the dynamic process that you had to undergo and looking at looking at apostolic networks kind of almost like morphing back into a denominational form uh, and, and the frustration that arose inside of you as a result of that. Now, imagine somebody 
um, is looking at your process, uh, what would you identify as some of the potholes that they need to be aware of? What should they be careful to avoid? What should they um, be quick to identify? What are some of those pitfalls that you think that you could um, at least say to me, I am trying to do uh, some of what you're doing, but what do you think I need to be aware of? Get, just identify maybe uh, off your head about three or four of them, uh, if okay. at all that much, yeah. Okay. I think the first one is um, exclusivity. Right. Exclusivity mm -hmm. is the big one. Because what exclusivity does is that it causes you not to be open to hear others. Beautiful. Yes, it creates the idea that we are the all in all. If it's not part of us, then it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So that, that right away is an issue. Um, the infallibility of the leader. Wow, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the infallibility of the leader, almost like your reference point is the apostolic leader. It's no longer the context of Christ or the context of the word and the truth. Mm -hmm. The third Good. thing is um, evidence, proof. What's been built so far? Right. Other, than, other than continuous knowledge, continuous insight, continuous profound revelation, uh, uh, what's that? And then to me, this really, I put it number four, but it's the big one. Mm -hmm. I can't explain how, but somehow that whole context begins to eat into the family structure and mm. destroys families. Yeah, yeah. Literally, there, there's conflict between the, 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 the couples because it's almost like if one queries the leader, then you are anti the system. If, 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 if one demands, uh, um, proof, then why are you uh, being negative? And when one goes out to a leader to discuss this, it's almost like if your spouse doesn't get with the program, then hey, they don't belong in the program. Right. So right. Th that was one of the excesses that I saw that we headed up into. Beautiful. And, and that didn't take away from the profound revelation. It didn't take away from the profound insight. That's the mm -hmm. amazing thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Crazy. You know, one of the things that you that I, I want to celebrate in, in your comment is this whole movement away from nebulous information to an, animated impartation. And, and that's how me, that's how I, I'm putting it up, that any truth that is communicated must be animated. It must have the capability inside of it to apply it, to make it real. And so the scripture you read in Malachi, to me, what Malachi describes basically, and what you have endeavored to do with, with um, the group of people that you've mobilized is not just to kind of impress people with information, but all truth must be applied. Uh, I think we come out of this zone where, where revelation is normally an ooh and ah response. Wow, never heard it like that before. And it stays in this nebulous zone of, of admiration, but it never is fully animated or applied. And I think um, it is something that all of us need to learn in this particular platform, particularly in an environment where truth is communicated with a lot of intelligence and a lot of profundity that we have to be able, we have to, be able to remove the, the, the gloss of profundity and get to the real hardcore issue in terms of applying. I like also what you said is that um, in the world that you would have interacted with, there was this constant inundating of knowledge and information, but, but the information was not trickling down to, to real applicable issues. So families were being fragmented. People were just kind of drifting and falling away. Churches were just kind of going through a rhythm of just uh, a monotony. Um, churches were not growing. I'm gonna use the word church. Churches were not growing. Um, the entire system was just kind of almost like hitting a reverse gear and not moving forward while all that was going on, there was this constant stream of good knowledge. And I think um, that to me is a, is a real, real concern in how we build because we don't want people to think that uh, depth of information equals uh, depth in God. Depth of information does not equal uh, accuracy in execution. Depth in information does not result in uh, effective animation of principles. And so at the end of the day, 
we could find ourselves almost like, like um, these advisors of Job. These guys were very profound, but yet still Job describes them as sorry advisors. And so profundity is far different from accuracy. You could be very profound, but what you're saying makes no sense and it cannot really be applied. So very, very good. Excellent. Anything else you want to add to that, Charles, before I jump yes, in? Yes, just, just, uh, just a, a funny bit is uh, mm -hmm. post that as we began to build Church Unusual and all the other concepts we have, Business Unusual and so on, I, 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 I had whispers. I got accused of becoming very shallow mm. in terms <laughs> of revelation. Now it became very shallow, very oversimplistic, you know, no wow. longer profound. Yet the impact we got was on an entirely different level. It was off the charts. But that's beautiful. Uh, um, what I mean, anybody wants to kind of, um, I'm, not, I'm talking about anyone on the call here now, just to kind of tag on to that last point that Charles made there, because you live in a zone where high voltage, voltage information is perceived as depth. And Charles basically shifted from high voltage depth to come, to come down to the nuts and bolts applicability of truth. And with that, the high voltage guys look back and say, but you're getting petty, you're getting shallow. But, but again, by their fruit, you shall know them. And I think that, um, that, 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 that I think is important. I see Kelvin put his hand up, maybe Kelvin will tag on. Now, this is open to anybody. If anybody wants to jump on, ask a question, shoot something at Charles, this is your moment or anyone. So Kelvin, uh, shoot. Real quickly, uh, what, what is coming out of what Charles uh, just said to me is that information does not constitute transformation. Mm -hmm. You can get yes. inundated and it never changes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and, and I guess you could fault both parties on that because um, at the end of the day, I know that I am responsible for to manage what I hear. I am responsible. But then again, if you give the person the wrong thing to listen to, then it really does not provide what I call triggers for correct action. And so part of impartation and part of communicating doctrine must be a combination of provocation. It must be able to lift them up. But at the end of the day, the thing you want more than anything else is applicability. The thing must be applied. It has to be executed. The thing must hit the ground and we must be able to see it working. So excellent. I see Ivan, your mic is open. I guess that means they have a comment to a comment yeah. to Charles. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I think, uh, Charles, you mentioned how you were accused of becoming shallow with your teaching. And I think key to discipleship, if you don't have any followers or there isn't a nation following you, then you have not uh, created a clear bridge to a deeper understanding of the kingdom. Uh, you, you, you can't make a, a disciple of anyone or any nation that doesn't understand where you're going. It's impossible. So um, I think that's why you got accused of making things so simple. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful, excellent. Now remember, remember all of you on the call, all of you on the on the call here today. You could direct your questions. You could either post it on the chat, or you could direct your questions to anyone here, um, or direct it directly to the to, to whoever would have been the last um, communicator. Since there's no one else jumping up to ask any questions, uh, then I'm gonna um, put David on the hot seat. David, welcome to Hard Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anderson. Thank you so much. Those, no. of you who are, those of you who are not familiar with Hard Talk, Hard Talk is a, is a BBC interaction <laughs> where this guy literally put people in a hot seat and asked them some hard questions, but these questions are by no means hard. Um, David, the thing, that, the thing that I admire in you is what I'm gonna describe as consistency, um, longevity, um, the ability to, to remain on point and on message over a long period of time. I mean, you have done this for 50 years, 50 years. And listen, that to me is absolutely commendable. Few people uh, have the ability to remain on message and on point and within the guardrails of the kingdom for, for 10 years. I mean, I've seen a Charles said, Charles talked about um, massive kingdom global organizations that started strong and then drifted right back into denomination, denominationalism. That has happened to so many people. Simple questions to you, uh, um, David. What is, what is the secret sauce? What is the stuff that 
that allows you to remain so consistent. Now, you would have seen the church go through all kinds of different movements over the 50 years. What is the secret sauce? What keeps you consistent? What allows you to kind of uh, stay on point, to maintain rhythm with the kingdom, to stand here in 2022 and still be very fixated on hearing more, learning more, throwing yourself more headlong into the purpose of God. Um, how do you do that? Tell us, help me in the process here. This could be very useful to me. How do you keep that level of consistency over all these years? And how, how have you seen it? Well, uh, thank you, Anderson. I believe it all has to do with the foundation of where I started with the kingdom. I mm -hmm. was part of a denomination that I grew up in. I was born on the front pew of that denomination. My father was a pastor and then later a leader within that denomination. So I grew up in a very, very uh, religious, legalistic uh, denomination with some very specific doctrines and theologies. When I began in the ministry, I was a, I began in that denomination. And one day I was preparing my typical denominational message for that coming weekend. And I was looking at Matthew 24. Within that system, there's always been a lot of talk about the end times. So I was looking at Matthew 24. And as I was looking and reading the verses, one verse jumped out at me. And, it, and as I tell it to all of you here today, it's like, I see that verse jumping out at me today the way that it did almost 50 years ago. And, and the verse was verse 14 of Matthew 24, where it says, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached and there is a testimony around the world, then the end will come. Now, I was seated that evening preparing a message for the body that had to do with end times. And all of a sudden this verse jumps at me and says that the end times is when the gospel of the kingdom is preached. And in that instant, something began to quicken in my spirit and the Holy Spirit began a process of illumination of what was the kingdom. I asked the question, I right away pushed back on my chair and I said, well, I thought we've been teaching the gospel of the kingdom. And, and, and it's like I heard a boy says, no, you've been preaching and teaching the gospel of your denomination. Has nothing mm -hmm. to do with the kingdom. Yeah. And so, so I had to, first of all, find the definition of what is the gospel of the kingdom. And the definition I got was that the kingdom was all about a government. It was not about a religious system. It was not an ecclesiastical organization, but it was the government of God, where the Godhead of that government, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, had an eternal purpose, not only for this earth, but for every person on this earth, and evolved around the fact that that government of that kingdom had an order, O-R-D-E-R. -E so my first year or two years of, of learning about the kingdom, I learned an awful lot about God's government and God's order. Mm -hmm, so when, mm -hmm. I, when I put up all the years of serving in denomination and looked at what my father had done for 60 some years as, as a denominational leader, I saw a huge contrast. As a matter of fact, I took a, a legal pad and I wrote down what I was beginning to understand, to have understanding what was the government and the order of the kingdom of God according to scripture and what was the doctrine, theology and the supposed order that we had as a denomination. And I mm. saw that it was the total opposite. It wow. was, it, one had nothing to do with the other. So mm. one day I had to answer myself a question. Am I going to continue to propagate, to promote, to be a part, to use the gifts and talents that God has given me to build a lie and a deception in this world? Or am I going to take a decision 
and begin to be a voice for God's government and God's order. Mm. And so I made the choice and I resigned, turned my credentials in and mm -hmm. believed God that he was going to take me wherever he wanted to. And until this day, he has never forsaken me. And I have stayed consistent. There's a, there, there, is, there are two men in this call today that have known me for many, many years. Ivan Gonzalez, he's known me for close to 35 years. And, and Gladstone Hazel from the Virgin Islands, he's known me for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And they can both attest that they've never heard me speak, say, or anything except kingdom, government, order, and the kingdom and the government and the order. Now there's a lot that is in that, but that's what I've stated. And I've not allowed myself to be influenced by anything else. I belong mm -hmm. to different apostolic networks. I belong to different organizations, but every one of them wanted to take me back to the structures of man, the structures of religion, the structures of ecclesiastical theologies and doctrines. But I would always come back, that's not the gospel of the kingdom. So what right. has kept me on course is a clarity and an understanding of what the kingdom is. Mm -hmm. Now, through the years, mm -hmm. uh, I, once I resigned, things evolved and God called me into an apostolic ministry around the world. And I've, I've been all over the world, 106 countries, and I've discipled hundreds and hundreds of men and women, men and women that were coming out of various denominations, various independent ministries. And I've seen men and women make that hard choice. I've seen some be very successful. I've seen mm -hmm. others not be able to do it. I've seen mm -hmm. others take it for a while and eventually go back to the vomit they came out of. I've seen others uh, give up and, and, and et cetera. Et cetera. And then I, I know others that they, they've been hearing the gospel of the kingdom for 35 years, 40 years, and they're still clinging to the mantle of religion because mm -hmm. they, they just can't get away. Jesus said to, to a key word when he first started his public ministry, and it's in Matthew chapter 4. And it's verse found in verse 17, it's found in verse 23 also. And he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, everyone thinks, and the understanding that mainly we've had of that word repent, that it has to do with the remorse of sin. But the word repent in Matthew 4, 17 is the word metaneo in the Greek, which has nothing to do with remorse of sin. It has to do with a change of your mind. Mm. A change of thinking and a change of direction. And what yeah. I have tried to teach every man and woman that the Lord has put before me through the years is, if you truly want to go with God's kingdom and purpose, you're going to have to have a metaneo in your mind. You're going to have to change of mind. You cannot continue dragging the vocabulary, the culture, the, the, some of the doctrines, some of the beliefs of, of what you were. No, you, you got to leave your house. You got to leave your relatives. If you bring Lot with you, he's going to be a pain in the neck. You got to either leave it all or you won't be. A, and I've learned this through the years. And I can say today in, in 2022, after many years of experience, that I've, I've observed men and women great leaders with tremendous gifts and talents. They've never been of any value to the kingdom because they refused to let go of their tradition. They Beautiful. wanted to mix the kingdom with the beautiful church that I grew up in. They wanted to mix the kingdom with the beautiful uh, legacy that my father left me when he left me this ministry. It doesn't work. That's, that's joining the licit with the illicit. And the book of Revelation says that is terrible. Mm. You can't join the illicit with the illicit. So to answer directly to the question you've asked me, I believe that the key to staying firm and consistent and consistent and consistent is you, you have to have a good foundation. Mm. You have to know what, what is the kingdom. If the kingdom to you is just another nice new word that you're going to come up with and some new messages, 
that's not enough. If right. the kingdom is just, oh, the kingdom of heaven and God is up there and the kingdom can, no. The kingdom is all about government and order. Right. Order. <laughs> God's law, God's principles, God's truth, God's order. Jesus in Matthew 16, 18, when he spoke to the disciples, when he, after he had asked them, who are they saying I am? And Simon came up and said, you are the Christ. And then he said the most powerful words he said when he was here on earth, on this rock, I will build my, when Jesus used that word there, he wasn't thinking of an ecclesiastical religious institution. He was thinking of government. He was thinking of the eternal kingdom government of God that would establish the order and the government. And the reason we have no government around the world, you know, I, I see men and women here from all the countries I've been to. The, the sister that's on here this morning, Anna, I've been to Guatemala 150 times. I, I probably know Guatemala better than her and, and <laughs> ministered there to thousands. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ivan knows one of his previous pastors, I took him down to Guatemala to give him a revelation of the gospel like 30 years ago. And, and, and I've been to Africa, I've been to Kenya, I've been to Nigeria, I've been to Trinidad. Been, and, and, and the thing is, there is no kingdom expression. There is not the authority of the kingdom. There's not the dominion of the kingdom. There's not the government of the kingdom. Why? Because the leadership, the spiritual leadership has been on this train, on this ship, called the religious mindset, the church, mm -hmm. the religion, the theology, and they don't want to let loose of it. Right. Everybody hears the gospel of the kingdom. I get people say, but I've read your book. What a powerful book. But they right away want to draw something out of it so they can apply to what they have. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Good. Um, excellent. There are a couple of things I want to kind of... Um kind of rehearsed because um, I find some, so many of them are so important. It's your foundation. One of the things that I've discovered, and um, David, you could jump, you could kind of expand on it too. One of the things I've discovered is that a lot of the new ministries that are emerging, they are being baptized into what I call the current emphases, but most of them are void of just the fundamentals. You talk about the importance of foundation. They are void, they have no understanding of the fundamentals. Um, so what is going on is that they are so aggressive in pushing forward what I call, what they call the present truth, which is another story altogether. People have yes. abused that scripture and Peter about the present yes. truth and have no understanding what present truth is, but they are, they are pressing forward, advancing current, uh, emphases, but they have no foundation. It's almost like, you know, Jeremiah said, I'll stand at the crossroads and I'll watch. I'll ask for the ancient path and walk in it. For Jeremiah, correct walking is not so much bulldozing your way into, into, the, into the current emphases. It also required at least standing in the ancient path. There are correct ancient pathways or foundations that we can't deviate from. And so, a lot of the guys today, they are good with articulation, but they are very poor in areas of personal prayer. Very good with doctrine about kingdom. And that's another talk because I find that the word kingdom has become almost like an obscene language. In the Caribbean, we use obscene as a noun, a pronoun, a verb, an adverb. And so today we throw kingdom around in, a, in all kind of willy willy manner. I want you to kind of go back and spend a few seconds, a few minutes again, and let's talk about the significance of foundations because a lot of people are just, if you, get, if, if you go to a bookshop, you're gonna read about the kingdom, you're gonna read about, about um, advancing and bulldozing forward and opening up the nations, but few people go back and wanna know about prayer. We're gonna go back and read about just sanctification, going back and read about holiness and walking with purity. Kind of, kind of take us back into the significance of foundations uh, and, and how it provides the correct underpinning upon which truth is built so that we don't become top heavy and we have nothing to support our movement. Describe, describe that process when you did it. I'll tell you something that, that if there's ever an area that I believe every man and woman that is in leadership or teachers or preachers, the gospel needs to understand. 
there is a big difference between the plan of redemption of the kingdom and the plan of salvation of evangelical traditional religion. Big difference. Mm -hmm. And most of us, we've grown up with the plan of salvation. And if I were to sit down with some just to, to just to ask you, well, what do you think about the plan of redemption? They said, well, isn't it the same? No, it's not. Mm. And, and in God's eternal purpose, he has always had the plan of redemption. It's a big difference. So right there, we have a foundational principle that if we don't understand as a leader, we can't communicate to those that are getting redeemed. So what do we do? We communicate that they're getting saved. Getting saved from what? Well, we tell them you're getting saved from burning in hell. And where am I going? Well, you're going to heaven. There you go. Lack of foundation already has you down the wrong path because that's not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is not to get you to heaven. The gospel of the kingdom is to reign and rule on earth. Mm -hmm. So the plan of redemption has a total, and that's just foundational. The second thing that is so foundational in the difference of the gospel of the kingdom and the tradition of religion is the order of God's government. I call it the flow of the organism. It begins mm. with the Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And how does that order come from above? Because everything comes from above. We've got to have an understanding that in God's kingdom, nothing is from down up. Everything is from up down. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's the way it is in the kingdom. And so how, do, how does that organism flow? Well, it begins with the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then the Son, before he left, he established governmental gifts, the fivefold ministry. And then the local congregation, the local ecclesia, then has the elders. And then you've got your serving ministries, which the scripture called the diaconia or the diaconists or the deacons. Well, that's the order. That's that's it. There's nothing else. There's no pastors. There's no associate pastors. There's no this. There's no. We got so many titles right now. We don't know what to do with them. The, 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 the printers are having a hard time when they're going to print a card for a leader because they don't have enough room for all the titles. <laughs> but in script, but in, in the kingdom, there there's just the Godhead, the fivefold, the elders. That's it. No more. And that's where the flow. So that's foundational. That is very founded. And if you don't have an understanding of how foundational that is, and you've got this mindset that it's all with the deacon board or with the other board or the council or the other council or, or the superintendent or the president and all these, then, then you're out of order. And right. no wonder God can't speak to you, that you have to get 10 men together to argue about an agenda for six hours before you can agree on something. And so God's order, flow, organism is not flowing because there is right. no basic understanding. And we could go on with more and more foundation, but I just Beautiful. throw two of them out. out at Thank you. you. Thank you. I, I, see, I see Tim. Tim, you have a hand up. So let me uh, ask you to shoot your tip. Yeah. You have to unmute him. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Real quick. First of all, excellent, 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 David. Uh, one of the things that I would ask, and maybe you could address this, there's people who are listening, and there are people who are involved in some of the very things that are keeping them um, in bondage, if you would, and they, they want a way out. They want to get out of this. They, they understand. They see the other side but they are afraid to do, like you said, to, to just really step out. And they're having, they're having this crisis of faith because they have such a vested interest in where they are. If you were to give somebody a one, two, three steps of, of what they needed to do to move from where they are to where they should be, uh, I'd like you to just kind of touch that, just kind of begin to look at it. Because I, I do know uh, when I first started making the shift, if you will, uh, there was this frightening feeling of, of loneliness, of fear, of yeah. ostracization, uh, of people who uh, thought you had been weird. I heard uh, my brother earlier talking about the different streams that they'd been in. Well, I've been through the deliverance. I've been through the, the apostolic. I've been through all these. And each time, uh, one thing that was common with each one 
You will call names. People begin to identify you as something weird. So, and people don't like that. So what would you suggest to someone um, going forward if they say, okay, I, I want to make this move, but what do I do? Yeah, and th that's why I said earlier, the key is having a good foundation and a conviction and an understanding and knowing that God is going to honor that truth that he revealed to you. See, the, the, the truth of the kingdom, I didn't get it at the cemetery. I mean, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, the seminary. That's not where I got it. I did not get it there. I got the truth of the kingdom from the word of God by the Holy Spirit. And later on, God brought some men that helped me to understand it even deeper. But all they did was just confirm what the Holy Spirit was already giving me. And I began to look for men that, 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 were, that I knew had a greater revelation. I used to fly to Australia just to sit with a man there in Australia who I respected as a teacher of teachers about the kingdom. And I didn't go there to preach. I didn't go there to minister. But I would pay a lot of money to go to Australia from Texas. But just to sit with him. And I would sit at his feet for two, three weeks at a time. And I, I would just be like a sponge. But I wanted to learn about the kingdom. Because I, had, I wanted my foundation to be solid. So that's key. Because see, when I resigned, I, I had my family go against me. My brother-in-law called me and said, you are not allowed in my home. And you cannot talk to my son and daughter, who are my niece and nephew. And for eight years, I had no communication with my sister, my nephew, my, all because I had left the denomination. I know what you're talking about, Tim. I know exactly. I know what it is to be called, a, you know, a leper and, and you lose friendships. I lost a lot of friendships. Uh, as a matter of fact, I lost a lot of, 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 of what at that time uh, was kind of my financial support. But I knew that I had a conviction. I knew that I knew because I knew. So your conviction has to be very strong on the word. You can't be following a man. You got to know that it's- That's good, that's good. You've got to have a conviction of the word. Second thing is, and I've always told this to men and women all over. It's like when you're going down a freeway and you got to make a U-turn. You don't make a U-turn at 90 miles an hour. You reduce speed. You look both ways and then you make your U-turn. And that's the other thing. You gotta, you, you can't go making a quick move because you're gonna flip the car and kill everybody that's in it. But you gotta slow down and 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 make look both ways and let the Holy Spirit lead you as you're making your turn around and going in an opposite direction. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of guys. They get, they get too emotional. They get their soul into it and, and they make decisions too quick. They even move too quick. They sell everything. They close down and they haven't even, they haven't planned. They haven't. So, so then later on, they find themselves that they're in a mess. They're in debt they can't, because they, they, they went too quick. So I always say, follow your conviction, but the Lord is not in a hurry. Just take time. Take time and he'll take you. He'll take you where you want to be. Yeah. Okay. I see um, um, Charles, you have something to say. Once Charles jumps in there, then we can have uh, um, um, Kevin also on his hand up. So, yeah, shoot, guys. Okay, I, just put the screen just... Up just, I just put that screen up just to underscore what, what, um, what, what Dave was talking about. Don't just don't be, don't be radical, don't be crazy. Contemplation is as critical as execution. Don't, don't, get, don't get spiritual whiplash by trying to make yeah. quick changes that, that has no thought. Contemplation is as critical as execution. Yeah, yeah Charles. Yes, I was actually adding on to that because one of the things that I have seen with a lot of people who want to make the shift, as, as David has said, there's a bit of a, a rush to get out of there. That's perhaps not, not very smart, but I've also seen another major issue where some people get locked in because especially if you're well-being or your upkeep came from the structure of the denomination where you you I've seen people stuck because children are in school rent is being paid mm -hmm. and yet they've got this 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 feeling they need to move on but then it's almost like I'm not going to put my family in jeopardy 
for the truth. So some get stuck. And uh, the part of the problem that, that we've been able to look at and resolve, and that's one of the reasons we, we began one of our platforms called Business Unusual, is in many of those systems, the idea of a minister getting into entrepreneurship or business or work was a no-go zone. So, so the, the, this is the other thing people have to deal with. And sometimes it's not just because of the way it's been taught, but it's almost like you've backslidden because you've taken up a job. You're backslidden because you're doing some level of business for the transition. So we've had to teach people that it's okay to be able to do this. It's okay mm -hmm. to be able to take up a job and to work or to do some business to tide you over. And nobody says once you're functional, unless you've overgrown, you need to give that up either. So that's the one thing. The other thing is we've been able to tell people not to be in a rush after exits to join. You mm -hmm. know, almost like, like, like a rebound, you know. There, there should be a season of quietness, a season of not being too quick to want to be part of something, but it's a, quick, a season of just listening and hearing, listening to different people as they speak and kind of finding your feet and, and your new language, your new voice, your new context before moving to the next level. Good, beautiful, excellent. Well said, and I hope that a lot of guys could get some help there. Kelvin, you're up, man. Yeah, Kelvin, Shamlet. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Andy. I um, was just considering the cost for transition, the cost for sight, the very high cost. Um, there is a passage of scripture in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, I believe, and it talks about how Assyria uh, would come against God's people who he was going to deliver. And it talks about how he says, don't be afraid of the Assyrian. He will smite you with a rod and she'll lift up a staff against you. And so um, just understanding that these, uh, that how people will turn you, uh, turn you away, who will not embrace you, who, you know, uh, it is a cost to walk away. And so that's why you're mentioning being deliberate about thinking, don't be knee jerk. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're weaning away and you're coming away uh, will have to be gradual, but uh, there's a price. and. Uh, you know, I know, you know, I know it's not my turn yet, but I'm, I'm, I can tell you about that price too. And, and, and the cost and being ostracized and how uh, you can be afflicted, but it's very well worth it. Well, you know, it's, it's sad how, how, the, how um, Christianity works. And I tell you more and more, I, I find Christianity to be totally distasteful. And I know some of you will hear that incorrectly, but Jesus didn't come to the earth to start a religion called Christianity. I have found Christianity to be one of the most um, ungodly environment. I mean, what Kelvin is describing, you would think, how would your Christian quote unquote brothers treat you like that simply because you are discovering a new pathway? Christianity still lingers on pettiness that um, they split hairs on small matters and little, little nonchalant issues that you would kick your brother out. And if you're a part of certain organizations, those organizations operate almost like, I was telling a group last night, that these organizations operate like ancient uh, UK. That if your name is Ireland and you chose to leave that particular arrangement, England will do everything to destroy you. They will literally kill your wives, rape your children in an effort to say you cannot leave. So that's how some organizations are. They, I mean, I'm sure some of you saw the movie Braveheart. Braveheart speaks to that, that here is a people wanting freedom, but the system will destroy you as opposed to just give you your liberty. And that's the system of Christianity. And that thing is cruel. Let me kind of make one quick comment about what both Charles and David said, the whole need for us to be careful in how we make these decisions. You know, Habakkuk said something in this season of critical change. I think it's Habakkuk chapter two. He said, I will stand at my guard and I will station myself on the rampart. And I will wait, I will watch rather, I will watch to see what he would say to me. Now that is, that is, that is Habakkuk trying to describe his next move. I would stand, I would stand on the wall. I would, I would sit and wait and I would watch. Now those are very important words. Eh? The whole need for you to slow down. Stop a lot of the things that you're doing. Wait and watch and just wait for directives. And it is out of that posture that God then came to Habakkuk and said, write this vision down. 
make it plain. Some of us are trying to maintain the same speed that we've always been in, and at the same time, try to negotiate a course that we've never made before. And that's where you get spiritual whiplash, where you running too fast, trying to maintain that same speed while at the same time trying to change. You've got to slow down. The other thing you have to understand is this, the kingdom does not allow for movement from one mountain to another mountain. And so most of us are very concerned about our title, our prestige, our honor. So in this organization, I was Reverend Dr. Man of God, Bishop Sir. But to make the transition, as Jesus said, every time the kingdom moves, you have to be born again to enter the kingdom. And that is not, when you think about Jesus saying, unless a man is born again, he can't enter the kingdom. You have to understand that the kingdom is always moving. So every time the kingdom moves, you have to be born again. You have to become a child and enter again. So here you are, as grand and great, you are reverend, bishop, whatever term you have, and then the kingdom moves and you are trying to negotiate your way into a new dimension, a new expression, a new landing point, a new, a new frontier. And you want to go there, but carry all of the all of the accolade and titles and honor and prestige. You have to become a child. And for some people, that's where the problem is that, that you are not prepared to become a child. Becoming a child means that you have to become dependent on others. So before maybe you had the money, the wealth, the prestige, the honor. Now here you are depending on others. Here you have to learn again. Here you have to kind of um, re-engineer your whole life to discover again. As a child, you don't have much title. You can't be called Reverend Dr. Bishop Child. Those things don't go together. And so people are not prepared to make those critical decisions. And so they would prefer languishing in their world, in the, in the former world, and not making the critical step to step into the new world. David, you put your hand up. Again, maybe you have a couple more comments to make. Then I saw uh, Muriel has a hand up. Then I'm going to quickly segue, and um, I'm going to put uh, uh, Frederick on the hot seat. Yeah, yeah just yes, two, two, two quick thoughts, just to submit to those that are listening and considering these realities of change. One thing I've learned in the kingdom, you don't chase titles. In the kingdom, you've got to know who you are. You've got to know what call, God has called you to be. You have to know your gifting, know and know your parameters, know your measure of rule. I know what I am and I know what I'm not. And I've never tried to be what I'm not. I just try to stay in my lane of what I am and let others be who they are. So that's number one. And here's the most important. In the kingdom, you don't chase money. Good. Let an old man, I'm 79 years old, that has lived by faith for almost 50 years, let an old man tell you, don't chase money. Let the Jehovah Jireh be your provider. Learn to, for the provider. And I'll tell you this, your provider will always see that it will be the vessels you least expected. The Beautiful. men and women that supported me 45 years ago, they're not even alive anymore. Most of them have passed away. But they passed mm -hmm. away and the Lord brought new ones. And some of them, they passed away or they walked away. They were only there for a season. But I have always made a, a, a commitment to the Lord that I was not going to chase money. I was not going to do anything because of money. Money was not going to be the factor. That was going to be the last. And I was going right. to trust and until I'm sitting here right now today, I ate a very hearty breakfast this morning, and I'm going to eat a great <laughs> dinner tonight because the Lord has not forsaken me. But I never, never chase money. And, and the Lord brings the people you least. I got, I got people supporting me right now that if I would have told you two years ago they were going to support me, you would probably told me that I was crazy. But that's how God provides. And Beautiful. that's the key to staying faithful and consistent. Knowing Beautiful. who you are, what God called you, and don't chase the money. Religion has made leaders be money chasers. Excellent. Guys, I hope that all of you on this call, the objective of this call today, we want to provide you with at least um, our stories, the story that, that, that defines um, each and every single one of us. I know that by two hours will not be enough because really, we need at least a full session with just Charles alone to drill into his story 
and pull out the value that we could all walk away with. We could, we could sit with ours. This man, David, has over 40, near 50 years. There's so many stories we could pull out of David uh, that we could walk away with value. So, so I'm really uh, wanting you all to, to pay close attention to the points that you are hearing and really capture it and walk in it. Let me read a couple. I know Muriel is online. Hold on one second, Muriel. Let me read a couple of comments in the chat that I want to pull out. I see um, Cheryl Lewis made a very important comment. I think that there's merit in placing caution around trying to find a formula. Now, good point, because the kingdom does not operate by formulas. The Bible says that the wind blows, no one listeth King James. And the moment you begin to take kingdom reality and lock it into a formula, you empty it of its power. I see Charles put a note here. Some Christian groups are like gangs. I'll, I'll, I want to amplify on that. It's not gangs, it's mafiaism. Some Christian groups are like mafia. They like the mafia, I think. And then uh, uh, Kevin, Kelvin kind of jumped on and amplified. He said, yes, gangsterism, gangsterism. <laughs> Guys, this is crazy. Um, then, Char, then I see Charles made another comment. For a, fact from, for, for a fact from experience, for someone living in Africa, God always provides. That's important. God always provides. Very, very good um, good conversation. I actually love this conversation. I like where it's going. So let me ask um, Muriel to jump in, maybe make a comment or ask a question. Remember, you could ask it, you could direct your questions to any single member of the panel. Those who would have spoken are still uh, yet to speak or you could just um, make a comment all together. So Muriel, the mic is yours. <laughs> yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to make a comment and then actually in what I have been listening and it's, um, I could just wanna be just, just parent and truthful today about especially the umbrella of Christianity. And I just want to say, um, it may, may not be um, po the most popular view today, but I wanna thank God for Christianity, the umbrella of Christianity, because under that umbrella, many of us have got, come to know God more and more. But I also want to agree with, the, with many who have said that it has become more as a mob or a gangster um, organization or a legalist organization where many of us have been very hurt um, by being trusting and just simply just wanted to know more about God. And, um, and in that, um, many of our lives have been almost destroyed and many lives destroyed and also lives, um, people turning back to, into the world because leaders and people of influence in the church have used their position to hurt and discourage many of us that have just had an honest opinion or honest intention to serve God and get to know God and even to serve under the umbrella of denomination in which um, you have been called or born into as myself. I can, I want to share today that I was born into the church and um, at what it what one time I left and I got delivered from I got delivered from being under an umbrella because when I went to a church I went to a no denominational church and I began to worship God for who He is and then God called me back into my community and it's in that community that I was hurt the most because they a lot of people who know you and are close to you would like like love you from afar but when they see what god is doing in your life want to elevate you or use you or your truth just as the pastor has said that he read the word of god in matthew and it revealed to him it's not the denomination but it's the kingdom and then you try to, to teach the truth you know you'll come up against your family's light upon your your um your like in the beatitude or into the ten ten commandments they I said you they be false witness against you and they rise up against you all manner of things everything that should not be in the church is in the church but I, in my personal experience there were times I was asking God to just give me the the green light to just leave you know I I'm suffering I'm crying on the way to worship and people say well why you do that. But you got to know where God has called you and you got to know your purpose for being there. And sometimes it may not be the most comfortable and it may not be the most clear, but you got to know like the, 
the person who spoke to uh, before me said, you have to know what God is doing in your life. And sometimes the path isn't easy. Yes, sometimes the path is to leave. Sometimes the path is to disconnect yourself from that denomination. But you know, the scripture always come back to life, you know, who's got it for you, who should be against you? Because truthfully, some of them, they leave such cars that they're all your own family and they, they try to destroy you. But God is always lift up a standard and you have to pray for them who despitefully used you because many of them would not be around to see what God is working through you. So that is my testimony today in the kingdom church. And I thank God for the kingdom church on this line today. Amen. Let me just quickly, if I could, I want to say this when I was listening to her, when she was talking about her take on Christianity, uh, there's a passage, Acts 22 and 12, uh, where Paul was rehearsing his uh, time uh, on the road to Damascus and how he was taken to Ananias. And there's a little statement. I love the little statements and, they, and what, they, what they actually speak to us. It says there was a man named Ananias, a devout observer of the law, a devout man under the law, highly regarded. Now, if anybody spoke against the law, it was Paul. Uh, Paul was the one who really pressed out and really dealt with the, the rigidity of the law. But what I have learned when I first accepted Christ, well, there was a time that I was under a leader who was very rigid in a denomination. But out of that, I learned some things. I learned how to to be steadfast, I learned how to, to show up, I learned how to do certain things. The, the point that I'm making that some, some of these things start off right and they go off the rails, we understand that, but we have to understand what they did in our lives in the season that they were there, um, why it was important. You know, uh, Christianity, we, can't, we can honestly say there's many places that have gone totally off the rails, have gone totally in the wrong direction. But at the same time, as she said, many of us got, we got saved in that system, but we have to understand what it did for us then, and then understand where we have got, come to today. And so uh, just wanted to throw that in, you know, as a, as a, as a point of reference, you know, it, it sometimes this may start off good for us, but then there's times we need to understand it was good for that season. And now it's time to move into something new. Yeah, beautiful. Before I, before I, um, I think that's a very, very good, um, good, Good interjection there. Before I actually um, throw um, uh, Frederick on the hot seat, um, Kelvin Chambers, um, a lot of what Muriel talked about there, and to some extent, some of the comments that were made there by Tim, as well as other comments made by David, <clears throat> a lot of that you can relate to in terms of um, what I would call the brutality of Christianity and um, uh, the way in which leaders can so easily abuse, assault, uh, castigate, try to cut you off at the knees. You've been, you, you must have had your fair share of that. Maybe um, give us a sense as to, as to how you responded to that. What, what, what was your response? Because you could walk away angry, you could walk away, you could walk away frustrated, you could develop perspective because no matter what circumstances you find yourself in, you cannot, allow the pain of the past to define your movement into the future. And so there must be some perspective that you can gather that will keep you sane, number one, that, um, that, that allows you to gradually extend your strides going forward. Because the thing about pain, particularly when it comes from those that you trusted, and it comes from those that you loved and those that were within your, 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 um, your West Wing, the nature of that pain is that is that that thing cripples you. It cripples you. It puts you. It it it, it does a, a number with your psyche. What was your experience like? Not into. I mean, the emphasis is not so much the, the experience. The the emphasis is more on the perspective. What was the perspective that you gathered from walking through those kinds of situations that you can help me with? I mean, um, I, I I have had situations. I'm still dealing with situations. How can you help me? What perspectives? can I gather from your life and taking a step forward? Yeah, Kevin. Thank you, Andy. Um, what I found was when you come into these systems, they all, you're always invited to give your heart. You have to, I mean, this is the revealer if you're serious now. We need to know your heart. We need you to give you, and when you open up, you're susceptible because you want, you, you're well-intended and, and so you open up your heart, 
And I find that these systems, what has happened, what happened to me is that there's a, um, a, a sense of, at first you're, you're welcoming and you're invited in, but man, I'm telling you, once you get in, then that thing changes. And so I found myself personally uh, a good listener, but I wasn't taught to speak. I could hear, but I wasn't taught to think. Everything was fear-based. So you had to be obedient. And so over time, it made you docile. And that's not an overcoming outcome. You know, I mean, you, you, you don't have a say, you can't think, you don't have a position, all those kind of things. And so I would have to say for a person uh, like that is to, you know, God is trying to get light into you. Okay. My first response was to be offended because no one wants to be told that what they're in is ineffective. You don't want to feel like you're, like you're stupid. No one wants to feel that. So you defend what you're in, even if you're not in the right thing, you defend it. So what Andy said about becoming a child, uh, you may feel like a child because of the abuse and you may be in that fetal position, well, then let that fetal position allow you to be open to rescue. Come to a place to where you can accept the fact, listen, I've been had, this happened to me. And one of the things that really has to happen is you got to really deal with the issue of unforgiveness. Because I'm telling you, when you're done up and you give your heart and you give your service and your time and your sweat equity and all these other kind of things, it can do a number on you. And so it can cause you to get offended. It can cause you to become bitter. And I'm going to uh, be sharing with a group uh, on Saturday about this issue about uh, the hidden part that David talks about in Isaiah 51 and 6. The, the hidden part, that's the part right there that there's a lot of things that are stored, not just the inward part, but the hidden part. And that's where a lot of things are stored there. And that's where I really got hurt. And so um, it took time. It took years, uh, particularly when I thought I was out of the religious system and I came into apostolic reformation like Charles and I thought that that was the panacea and coming into the panacea you open up your heart again and you only find more abuse then you back away from the table and you say man I just God I need you to lead me now because I can't seem to make the right decision on this mm -hmm. but yeah it does something to you and you have to ward against bitterness because here's the thing if I come out and I'm saying that I'm free from that system, well, then I shouldn't be mad. I mm. shouldn't be upset. <laughs> you know, I mean, I should act like a free man. But it, 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 it brings a lingering pain inside that has to be addressed. And well, so it takes time. It really takes time for us to do that. Excellent. I, I thought there's so much inside of there. That, um, guys, let me, let me say something. Huh? We, it's now already um, 20 minutes to, to three on the East Coast. And I know we normally aim to finish this conversation at three o'clock on the East Coast um, and the equivalent time wherever you are in the world. But can you at least, can I beg of you at least 15 minutes more? I find that this conversation is way too relevant and way too significant for us to just kind of come at three and just jump off. Um, I, I really want Frederick to kind of um, uh, give us his story um, and to at least help us going forward. But there are several things that Charles, not Charles, that Kevin said there. One critical thing that I, that I want to kind of pull out there. And if you happen to be a leader on this platform and you have a significant amount of influence over people, how do you treat when somebody gives you their heart? I'm using the language that Kevin used. How do you treat that? Um, do you trample upon it? Do you believe that you're entitled to it because, well, you are reverend, pastor, man of God? Do you abuse it? What is your disposition? Now, this is David. Let me give you the, the, the Davidic response. David one day stood and he said, if only I could get a glass of water from the pools of Bethlehem. And guys risked their lives. And they fought battles to gather a glass of water and give it to David. Now, the image is that they went through enemy lines to get the water. How do you think they brought it back? They had to fight through enemy lines to bring back that glass of water. Imagine they are holding that glass so that the blood will not spill into that. And the effort, they gave their lives and they brought that glass of water back to David. 
Now, abuse is when David could take that water and assume that he's entitled to it, kick his head back and drink it. David's response was, this is too precious for me. He poured it out as an offering. And if that heart is not inside of you and you're a leader, then you are standing in a position ready to exercise abuse on others. And that's the thing that will have a whole bunch of good men on a pile of heat, just basically left for dead. And we have no idea the assault, the scars, the wounds, the bruises that we leave with people when we do not know how to regard their heart and regard their trust and treat their sacrifice the way David did it. This is too precious to me, David said. He poured it out as a drink offering. I found that was important. Before um, I open up the line for us, I saw that, that there's a comment, but let me read something that was left on the line by um, uh, a few persons. Somebody made this comment. Let me read this here. I think this is Errol Lewis. J. L. Lewis made a comment on the chat. He said, in Shawshank Redemption, um, experience, silence is important. Now, this is Errol uh, identifying the Shawshank reality principle we looked at. In the Shawshank Redemption experience, silence is important. That's a good point. He's talk, he talking about the principle of breaking out of jail. A solitary focus on your goal, very important. This guy was fixated on his goal. Knowledge that you may have to swim through a, a, a lot of excrement before you get to your freedom. I found that to be a really very good error-like kind of comment. In Shawshank Redemption experience, silence is important. A solitary focus on your goal. Knowledge that you may have to swim through a lot of excrement before you get to freedom. Somebody's mic is on. Um, okay, did you get that Errol's point? Very important point. Okay, I see no other hand is up, so let me jump straight to uh, Frederick. Um, welcome to Hard Talk. Are you there, Frederick? Yep, I'm here. Welcome to Hard Talk, Frederick. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if I've ever not 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 been in a hard talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for many of us, the hard talk is always yeah, it's that and a cup of coffee. Yeah, well, real for real, for real. Frederick, you, you see the the, the the direction that the conversation is going. I don't need to. I don't need to almost like tee you up at all. Um, you can t tell us about your experience because I mean, um, your perspective now compared to what it was like 15 years ago, working in God is completely different. You have yeah. come into a level of sight, you've come into a level of awareness, and that sight and awareness, it is defining the very operations, the ministry, the message, every single thing about your operation now could be contextualized or be summed up in the, the, the context of what God has allowed you to see. What brought you to that? And in, in describing what brought you to that, you can equally identify maybe a couple of pointers in what will help me to, to make that same critical jump in my own life. Because guess what? I struggle to. I, I am deep inside of a religious world and I'm trying to at least exit this religious world and step not at just into the broadness of the kingdom, but the specificity of Anderson's call and mission and mandate. So... I leave the mic in your hand. I'm going to mute myself so that I can listen clearly. So oh, no, no, no. I, yeah, I'm not. I'm, I can't be left on the hot seat. You're going to have to <laughs> shine, shine okay, the torch light. I'll, I'll leave the line open and give you my amens along the way. All right. So shoot, go on, Frederick. Um, I, I think I'd say, uh, from in terms of my experience, I would encapsulate it in one sentence, and that is, unless a seed falls to the ground, um, I think that when we come to, or certainly when I came to faith, and I'm sure for many, it was a very dramatic moment. I was 21 at the time. Um, and you're opened up to, you, the first reality you're opened up to is, is God is God is living. Not, not just God exists, you know, uh, if, if I was an agnostic historically, so I didn't have, I, I didn't not believe, I wasn't an atheist, I didn't think that God didn't exist. I knew there was some intelligence out there and had been involved in, in, in our design, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And the nominal Christian, Christian uh, experience I had was very, very little uh, in, my, in my family. Um, so for me, the revelation of, of Christ 
was a real living reality that God lives. Um, and, and that completely changed my world. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things when I look back at that first phase of my life up until that coming to that re progressive revelation of the kingdom, I think often what I, I, did, I didn't anticipate, because nobody taught me and it, and it wasn't clear to me, that in that first part of my journey of discipleship, for that matter, there, was a, there is a death process. There are things that have to die on the inside of you. And the, the, some of the things that have to die as well are the things that you often attach yourself to. You know, when, when a child is born, they cut the umbilical cord, you know, and that's the first separation from the environment that the child was, was born into, or uh, uh, well, was conceived in, which was the womb. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. so, so one of the challenges here is I think that for many of us, we're born into the kingdom, but we exist within the womb of our, of whatever of its fellowship, church, or ministry, for that matter, we exist in, in, in the womb. Now, the reason why I say fellowship, church, and ministry is because I actually think that due to ignorance, uh, due to sincerity, um, coupled with ignorance, I think people, uh, there is a, a notion that every single person that's called at some point has to lead you know, a church or a community. And so as a result, people often come to faith within communities that actually weren't called into being they were fabricated by the leaders who thought they were to lead churches i hope that makes sense mm -hmm. so the environment then the womb that you're born into you know you end up having to be if you're going to translate into a pathway towards maturity you have to be cut away from that womb you mm -hmm. have to be that, that 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 disconnect has to happen and for many of us our experience within the context of church or ministry or fellowship, it becomes a very difficult experience being cut away because the circumstances and the experiences that cut us away um, can be so traumatizing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you've got to realize for many of us, we've been swimming around in that womb thinking that womb is the world. Yeah. That's what we've been taught. And, and, and with that came all this, you know, you know, when children, when children in the womb, they hear that they hear, they can hear the noises of people around them, but they're unintelligible. So yeah. it's all about free. It's all about frequency. And for many of us, I think that we, we, I certainly for myself, you heard the Lord, but you also didn't hear the Lord. Mm. It's kind of mm -hmm. like you, you were in, you were in frequency, but you didn't have the understanding that helped you to realize or conceptualize it. And that I think that's the other thing about being young in the Lord is you cannot conceptualize the revelation, so you can't practicalize it. Right. So, right. so you, you know, I always say you've got to move from revelation to conceptualization to then practicalization. And, and I think that what for many of us, we were, tr we were within the context of the church or the fellowship or the ministry. We were trying to figure things out. They, it wasn't working. We couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. But we believed that if we just did more, somehow we would get a breakthrough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why a lot of the language you hear in church is always about breakthrough. And it's always about um, your time, like your time will come. It's always about this prophetic sense of God's going to make a way for you. That's the language that you constantly hear. And I think that there was for some for some we gave up, we dropped our hands for myself. Um, you know, I had particular personal experiences. The, the, when I talk about the seed falling to the ground, um, it's because there was a, I had to pay, a, I paid a personal price for where I am now. And that personal price um, was something that you can't fabricate. Um, and it, it, I'm still within the process of seeing God turn that personal price around for, by God's grace for his glory mm -hmm. so I think that I struggle to look back and you know from this position and point the finger at any one person whether mm -hmm. it's leadership whether it's community because I kind of look I look at what was there and for whether it's for its successes or failures what I come out with is wow how immature we were 
um, mm -hmm. and how immature we were with God's word. Um, and so in that regard, I don't have a sense of, I don't have a sense. I think there are people sometimes in your community that are vindictive. I think there are people that are there that are manipulative, that are trying to, um, they are focused on themselves and they want to see the prophetic agenda for them realized that they don't really care about others. And there's a lack of, a lack of, uh, of a desire to see what I would consider to be a real truthful working Commonwealth community. Um, mm -hmm. You find that there, but, but the thing about it is when you, re, you and I know that the more you read scriptures, the more you see how many problems there were in family and communities and in tribes and in nations. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not unusual, <laughs> you know, <laughs> So, so you sit there and you ask yourself, well, when I look at the calamities I've been through and the challenges I've been through, you know, well, get in line. There's so many others that have been through the same in order for the kingdom to be realized. Mm -hmm. You know, so so I can't I can't in this position, you know, you have to forgive. You can't take it to heart and you have to recognize that what you need is is the wisdom to be able to navigate your steps. Um, and, and, and in the midst of it, recognize that uh, that for many, for those even that, that didn't know, understand the transition and didn't know how to how to support, because some people didn't, you know, some people turned their back on me simply because they didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. They didn't understand. They didn't. I had one person who came back to me a few years later and apologized and said, you know what, they were so broken by the situation that they actually didn't know what to do. Mm. They did not know what to do. They were bereft of wisdom on how to manage the situation. So they literally just stepped away and looked for healing themselves. Mm. And that was like, wow, because, you know, you don't always realize how much your life impacts other people. Um, mm. And when you have to make certain decisions and when you're going through very difficult situations and it's a decision between the kingdom uh, and, and the church or the kingdom and ministry or the kingdom and your per personal desires, you know, you have to, you, when you're confronted with that reality, any, even the, the, the most careful of steps is still going to offend somebody and hurt somebody and injure somebody. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think for me, my, my journey in the last 15 years has been one where for a while, I decided I was going to grapple with it alone because I didn't find many others um, that were that were working in, in the same frequency. Um, when some did come to the foreground that seemed to be going in a similar direction, I obviously tried to work with them and, and, and see how that went. Um, but, you know, I think one of the key things for me in this entire endeavor and, and the direction is about trusting purely in the sovereignty of god mm -hmm. i can't i can't go i can't go beyond that the sovereignty of god is something where it dictates everything for me in terms of success or failure and working with people because the people you start with isn't always the people you remain with isn't always the people at the end so you've got to you've got to hold to the, the lord closely but you've got to also work with people loosely um, mm -hmm. And you've got to, you've got to let them. I think we've got to give one another a chance to work through things. I think sometimes we're so we so want people to be at the same pace as us that we forget that their their, their journeys are going to be dictated by their own levels and personal degrees of sacrifices, mm -hmm. um, and their personal will their willingness to pay whatever price they have to pay for this. Um, you know, you can't you can't take away from that. There is a personal price, there's a cross to carry, and your ability to move forward in the context of the kingdom is dictated by that. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's Christ. That's that's in that's sitting in the mirror with Christ in front of you, and Him saying to us, "This is the way you need to go in. This is the way you need to think about it. But are you prepared to pay the price for it?" Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, so many things that you like, like, like every other conversation. There's so many very important, salient aspects that are inside of the common. Um, uh, let me let me kind of circle back around to what I will deem the productivity theater. You, productivity theater is a concept that they use today to describe a lot of activity, but it's all on show. Nothing is being produced. A lot of action, but it's all on show. Nothing is coming out of it. 
And um, you made you made a comment um, in light of that. I didn't really. I, I'm not quoting it verbatim, but the whole issue of a lot of activity, but at the end of the day, there's not much going on. Um, you you want to kind of remind me of the exact term that you said and maybe expand on that a little bit and, and how do we break that? What do you think is critical to, to canceling that, what I call the hustle, the hustle culture? The hustle culture is where so much work, we just put so much energy in and at the end of the day, nothing comes out. So uh, how do we break that? How do we cancel that particular rhythm? So, I, I, uh, so from my experience, I think um, the, way, the, way, the way we think about our community has to change. It has to change in terms of the way we gather. Um, and as I, as I mentioned before, I think there's to change the outcomes. You have to be willing to revise the way you gather, or the way you assemble, and the purpose for which you gather and assemble. It needs to be driven to to be more practical, um, and and less, like I said, less focused on liturgy and more focused on on outcomes. Um, and I think. I think the other thing as well is, is I know, for example, in, in, in our community, one of the things we have, we have fam, what we call family elders in our community, but I encourage, I encourage those in our community to not just source from our springs. Um, I encourage them to be open and engage with other ministries, other organizations, um, and essentially be, uh, be the type that basically goes out, gets information and brings it in for the perfection of the local body. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that, that point you make, I, I want to kind of, I really would like you to underscore that again, say it again, the whole issue of do not source only from your spring. Because the, the thing is, man, most leaders have this weird notion that, that listen, if, if at all you go, and you gather information from the church down the road, then it's defined as disloyalty in organizations. Yes. That's how we treat yeah. it. And, and so what we do with most of our members, and I'm sorry, the term, the term is vomitatious, really. Members, is, the, the thing feels cruel to me. But what we do with those people who are within our orbit, we almost want to lock them inside of this echo chamber where all they hear is what we continue to speak to them. And little do we realize we are creating these cultic forms, um, locking people into a world that is not beneficial to them nor to us. And that sometimes is what, is what contributes to the, the, the morass of Christianity. Um, I think it is so liberating to hear you say to, to, to the people within your orbit, you cannot source only from your stream. Um, can you say that again, in whichever way? How could you emphasize that? How could you drill that hole? If you could put it in an ivy and hardline that to all of us would be perfect. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I, think, it's, it, I think there's a, a, a conscious, there should be a conscious effort in any leadership to be outcomes focused and, and actually design, purposefully design the way people come together. But it starts with leadership. If leadership are, are willing to be open and focus on on outsourcing um, help and support from all over the body of Christ mm -hmm. in order to support the local body of Christ. I, it's been interesting. So for me, in the last I, when I when I started this journey, I I was not interested in even though I, I had the message of uh, of kingdom citizenship, I was not interested in going out and preaching it. It just was not. It was not something I was motivated by. I wanted to focus on refining the message, mm -hmm. um, and 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 so I, I spent a lot of time with the team, sort of wrestling and, and grappling with it, and refining it, and, and making it clear to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, then I think then what happened was I then began to think about okay, um, how would I how would I now you know communicate that to others, but also I began to realize something, and that was that for me personally that I was not, um, whilst I might have been uh, an elder in the community, I, was my, I wasn't fully responsible for the community alone. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn to step away in a manner that meant that I was not the primary uh, cover for the community. 
Yeah, I'm not yeah. a pastor. That's not. I'm not a pastor. It's not my call. All right. And I don't yeah. even believe. I don't even. As as David mentioned earlier, I don't even believe the five. I believe the fivefold actually operate regionally, um, and I, I don't believe that they are to be uh, overseers of any communities. I think elder, family elders, and community elders do not should should be given the support to do that job. Frankly, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think that. But what I, what I realized was that. I realized that I had to be the one to begin to go out and connect with people and bring their voices into the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, that's when I started to take the approach, which was how do I build society into community? Um, so then it, it broadened my mind that actually the, the office I work, I, I, the office that I function in is, is, is not for this community, it's for the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So I needed, to, I needed to begin to think and work in that way, providing services for the body at large, whilst, uh, whilst residing in my local community and supporting the community. So mm -hmm. I think that that pattern of behavior then works itself out, you know, in terms of within the leadership. And so they now have responsibilities to, for themselves in their areas to design uh, and bring in the resources to support the local, the local mm -hmm. community. Excellent, excellent. Um, let me, um, I know Ivan is almost manning the chat. And so um, let me applaud I, Ivan for, for responding to the question. One critical question was asked and Ivan responded, responded to it. Let me read the question because I think there's so much in the question. Joel is asking this question, hi Andy. You mentioned kingdom undergoing changes, and to each one we must be, and to each change we must be reborn. Would you please give one such uh, example of change? I find myself thinking of the scripture where Peter asked Jesus to wash all of him, and Jesus said only if his feet needed washing. I wasn't aware of multiple rebirths. Please forgive my ignorance. And Ivan um, responded. I see Ivan jumped in. And Ivan. Um, Maybe I could I could ask you a post apart from just kind of um, reading your comment here. I'm sure that your comment is only but a minuscule of a lot more that you have to say. It's like a microcosm of what you have to say. So let me kind of um, throw the mic in your court. Two things I'm going to show at you, throw at you, my um, 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 Ivan. Sorry to kind of make that quick segue uh, from from um, from Frederick's comments. I really have a couple more questions to ask Frederick, but I'm trying to be loyal to the time. I'm still trying to respect the time while at the same time, trying to really bring everybody's story to bear on this conversation. But listen, it continues next week. So Ivan, let me give you the mic for a while to tell us, um, maybe you can respond to the comment you made on the chat pad and um, extend on it wherever you see necessary. Sure, so I responded to Joel's uh, comment by saying, Joel, I thought I would respond from another perspective to your question. Uh, the, the scripture that says take, you know, taking captive every thought to the knowledge of Christ doesn't happen instantaneously. It is one or two thoughts at a time. At the timing of Jesus, when he thinks you're ready to consider the next thought that needs challenging, it's like being reborn again and again. So I equated it to uh, being reborn to that text um, and, and that's particularly because of my own personal journey. Um, while Andy was introducing us and asking us to pre prepare, I quickly jotted down what I think are potentially chapters to a book that I may write someday. The first chapter would be titled, Not My Dad's Religion. Uh, the second chapter would be, Is That All There Is to This Christian Thing? The third chapter would be, If You Are Real... I will follow, follow you wherever you lead me. And then the fourth chapter would be from church to ecclesia. What's the big deal? The fifth chapter would be from a member to a citizen. Why the difference? The fourth chapter or the seventh chapter will be the word as the sword. And the eighth chapter would be Jesus as the premier surgeon. And then the two scriptures that I would use at the end would be John 10.10, 10, that Jesus came to give, it, give us life and life abundantly. What does it mean that he wants us to have life abundantly while we're here on the earth? 
And the second scripture, which was instrumental and pivotal in my journey, is Colossians 1.13. And I want to read that one because it just uh, resonated with me while I was reading it again. Um, most of you know this. I'm reading from the Amplified, and it says, For he has rescued us and has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. It doesn't say to the religion of his beloved son. Mm -hmm. It says to the kingdom of his beloved son. Anything that is not kingdom is in the dominion of darkness. Mm -hmm. um, so starting with that first one, not my dad's religion. I, as David mentioned, grew up in the same denominational structure. My dad was a pastor in that structure. And that's all I knew for the first 15, 20 years of my life. And then I got something, God always uses questions with me. I got these, in Spanish, it's inquietudes. Um, I got uncomfortable. I got antsy. I got, I started questioning why I believed the way I, that I did or what I even believed. I only believed what I believed because I was just following the routine and the traditions of my parents. I didn't have my own faith. I didn't have my own understanding of who this God is that they were talking about. And so I got hungry. I got hungry to know this, this God in my own way. I didn't want religion. I wanted God. And I, I started getting really, I started questioning, why do we do what we do? What is this? Why do we, why do we go to church on this day? What is, what, why do we do all these things that we do in this church? Why do we start, why is the order the same every single time we get there? Why don't the messages change? I heard this message 10 years ago, and this is the same message. I'm bored. I don't understand. Isn't, isn't a life with Christ, isn't a life with God supposed to be life-giving and, and, and purposeful and transformative, not only to myself, but to other people that are moving in that direction are we moving or are we just repeating uh, the same liturgies the same sermons year after year after year is anybody growing this person has been struggling with this issue for many years why aren't they getting help why aren't they changing if jesus is alive and he's real and he's supposed to be in our lives then why aren't people changing why is there still gossip why is there still why aren't people being healed why I was reading the Bible more and more, and I was asking myself the question, God, why aren't you doing the same things that you did during, this, during the writing of the Old and New Testaments? And I just, I got antsy. I got tired of the routine. I got tired of the traditions. I got tired of not seeing any kind of life. And when I read those texts, John 10, 10, I, I've come that you may have life to the full. I asked myself the question, why don't you have life at the full? And I went on a pursuit of, of Jesus. My junior year in college, I had an epiphany in my room. I was desperate to know this God. And I cried out to him and I said, Lord, if you're real, I will follow you wherever you go. I want to know you. I want to know what your, what your purpose is for my life. I want to know what direction you want me to take. And so I just yielded. And I went to my room and I laid down on the floor and I said, Lord, I just, I, I want you. I don't want anything else. I want you. And I can only describe it as a, an epiphany. There was you know, light in my room. I was there for three hours on the floor, just uh, in, a, in a state of, of a realization that Jesus knew me fully through and through without any doubt in my mind. And I got up from that place with a hunger to know more and more of who my father was. And so for a year, I just let him lead me to different places. I packed up all my things and move, um, moved from the Midwest to the West Coast, just following his lead. God supernaturally provided different people to provide transportation for me, money to go to school, anonymous donors, um, provision like for anything that I, that I needed. And I really believe that he was just teaching me that he was real and that I could trust him just as a baby trusts its mother. And... Uh, after a while, that lifted, that general, that presence, that ongoing presence lifted. And he said, now I want, want you to walk more by faith. Just trust me. I will lead you. I will guide you to the right people, the right places, the things that I want you to do. Doesn't mean I haven't fallen. Doesn't mean I haven't taken different tracks. Doesn't mean I haven't made mistakes, sinned. 
it means that my heart is completely yielded to whatever it is he wants. And I, and I, to this day, I'm 63 years old. I've seen my kids grow up. They're married to wonderful women. I've got five granddaughters and we are um, sharing this kingdom journey together and really trying to press into God about how he wants us to um, look, see the kingdom manifest in this region where we live. And so that's, that's, um, generally how I've come to this place and in meeting and in connecting with Andy and with the rest of the folks on this call, it's been um, inspiring to see how this platform provides a place for us to ask tough questions to, to, to the questions that are in deep in the deepest part of your existence and the deepest part of your journey as a follower of Jesus. This is a place where you can come and ask those tough questions mm -hmm. and share where you're at and not be ostracized for a difference of per perspective, but be mm -hmm. genuinely honored and loved and cared for. And um, I just uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this with you. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Um, I know that um, um, a lot of what Ivan is, um, has mentioned there really represents issues that are very, very dear and very pertinent to him but they are by no means um, specific to him alone. As I said, um, there's a scripture that says that the word of the Lord came to Israel and fell upon Ephraim. And so um, in someone telling their story, we can more or less, as I said, identify ourselves as almost like characters within that narrative and um, learn how to improve our own process as well. I know that um, Kamau has had his hand up for a while and Charles put his hand up. If I could really just take these two comments and then we're gonna um, turn the mic back over to Kelvin. So um, come out, you had your hand up for quite a while now, by now you're getting a hand, hand pain. You can unmute, Henry. Hi, hi, thanks, thanks Adi, thanks very much. Well, yeah, these are very, very good uh, discussion. And I was thinking, could it be that maybe we got stuck more in the Levitical order than the Melchizedek order. Because when you look at Hebrews 7, it talks clearly of why Jesus was not born in the Levitical and he was born in the Melchizedek order. And therefore maybe we got stuck so much in the Melchizedek, in the Levitical, and there we are not able to shed it off. And therefore, yes, the hearts are really winning because I was looking at all these issues of religion where we came from, and which is not very interesting. And then end up wondering, well, where we are and listening to the story. Is it that we got so much comfortable because of the titles, because of privileges and all that in the Levitical, but we forgot that we were called in the Melchizedek order? Yeah, I, 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 that, that's I, my comment. I personally believe that we've created a, a universe and really thought it was a universe. We created a little tiny little world in which the pastor was the supreme master. And with him asserting himself as so grand, he created a world of sycophants and uh, people interpret their sycophancy as loyalty to the work of God, not realizing that they were throwing themselves recklessly behind a man. And then leaders built all these other, other systems. And so we had these um, uh, armor bearer titles and people running behind you like little minions to carry your Bible to the podium. We create all these stuff in order to, to, in order to push the pastor up as this grand, mighty individual. And all of that contributed to us living by liturgy and abandoning life. And so I totally agree with you, Henry, that, that we basically created, and I'm gonna use the term, we created a puniverse, and we thought was this grand kingdom universe. It was tiny and small and petty, and that is still, even though people have abandoned that particular world, it still informs so much of their Christianity today. So as I said earlier, they are free, but still held in chains. And so I um, totally agree. Um, Charles, you had your hand up. Let me give you the mic as well. And then um, then we shoot, then we give the microphone back to Kelvin. Thank you very much, everybody. I know we, we went a little longer than normal, but I found it to be totally useful. Yeah, Charles. <clears throat> All right, I hope uh, Frederick will have time to respond to this. Actually, I just wanted to throw this back to him because of a very simple issue. Well, not so simple that comes up as we open up. Remember, as I began my own presentation, I spoke about the era of the exclusivity 
where yeah. we made the mistake of being exclusive and not allowing anyone else to speak into the space. Having said that, we now have this interesting unfolding environment. I, I'll, I'll mention how I have uh, responded to it, not necessarily right or wrong, but just a thought to see where Frederick would go with this or anybody else on the panel. And this is the issue where when people then go ahead and uh, drink in other springs, and then uh, for lack of a better word, want to bring the spring water home. And th this, this is basically the joke behind it. I've had scenarios where somebody says, you know, I went to this, this place and this, this pastor said this, what's your response? And you know, half the time I would say, you know, I didn't say that, so I don't have the response. If, if I had said it, then it would be good for me to respond because I don't want to get drawn into the context of critiquing or seemingly smarter or better than where that's coming from. And so um, where, where do we get, or, or other times when somebody would, and this hasn't happened so much to me, but I've had people query, how do we handle this when somebody say, for example, will come into my environment, hear what we have to say, and suddenly off they go and they want to adjust their leadership in the context of what they've heard, you know. Sorry, did hi Charles? Did you did you want me to feed it? Yes, that? yes, please. I, yes, that, I, I, you know, I think one of the things for me that um, is quite liberating is this idea that as soon as we, wherever we gather or wherever we assemble, even in this call, for example, my mentality now, which is very different to many many years ago, was I am assembling, I'm assembling or or gathering with citizens and there is a degree of autonomy with every single individual regarding how they work out their salvation and i do not have control over their salvation they don't have control over my salvation um, we we collectively when we come together are to uh, our attention is unto the lord and and his sovereign and his sovereignty now I say that because if you have been privileged to be able to share the kingdom of God with people, then the emphasis is what, what, how much of that, of that which you have shared remains with them in such a way that it enables them to go out into the world, engage with any church, any ministry, and it enables them to, through, the, through the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit, enables them to filter between that which is good and that which isn't good. It enables them to um, be able to walk through the walls of any religious institution, of any form of, of institution that has some, you know, um, that has an, uh, an identity that is not consistent with the kingdom, but enables them to have the capacity to engage with it and not be fearful because they are working out their salvation. Now, I appreciate that for some that come to faith, they come, they're new, um, they're nepios, for example, um, they're very young in the Lord and they need guidance. But also one of the challenges we face is we have we face a lot of people transitioning who believe that they're older than they are. And because of that, it can be difficult to guide them because they they their form of discipleship that they the, the way they've been nurtured in their discipleship in their old setting is the type of discipleship where it's hand to mouth. And so they've not been nurtured in a way where they have to learn themselves again to sit there with the scriptures and grapple with the scriptures and, and through the grace of God, be able to out of it emerge revelation, wisdom and understanding and their own voice that comes with that as well. So sometimes I think that these tensions that are taking place, these resistances that take place when somebody's hearing something from another community or from another church or from another ecclesia for that matter, or one that calls itself an ecclesia, Sometimes when they hear these things and they bring it back into the community, it's an opportunity for everybody to talk about it. It's an opportunity for everybody to say, okay, well, this is what you've heard. What do you think? Scripturally, what do you think about it? And let's go to the scriptures. Let's be Berean about it and let's flesh it out. And let's come to an accord that we can agree it was right or it may not be right and why. And that, that's, uh, but do that as citizens. Um, 
And I think that that my hope and prayer is that that breeds a more mature community um, rather than a siloed community that actually could become immature because it's not fit for the world that it's existing in. I'm good with that. I guess that that brings it <laughs> clearly into perspective. Well, can I can I just say one? Can I just say one thing? You yes. you you have children, don't you? Yes. And and if you Bulldogs. don't mind, how old how old are they? I'm a grandparent. I've got two right. grown ups, oh, married, and a granddaughter. Right. So you've got you've got you've got laps on me. My boy's sixteen years of age, and I think the reason why the reason I was gonna uh, wanted to raise that is because you know what it's like to raise children to live in society, to live in the world. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's that's the that's the goal, isn't it? Even within our communities, the emphasis is we're there to help and support people become active citizens in the world we live in, which means that there's a level of uh, maturity and autonomy with that, where they understand the father's business, they know how to take a stand, and they know how to get support to do that. So I think that for me, I don't think discipleship is the end. I think citizenship is the end. I think discipleship is the is the the uh, the tools, the method, the approach, the methods, the tools we put in place to help to produce citizens within the ecclesia. Um, and I think that the success of an ecclesia is ha is how many active citizens that it's a that it raises within society who can truly be ambassadors for the kingdom. Um, and that sometimes that meaning being an ambassador is also being called, I call it called to the called out, you know, being able to engage with the churches and the ministries around us regarding these tenets, these truths that David talked about regarding the kingdom and helping others to become unlocked and liberated as well. Okay, thanks, man. I think you've just said something absolutely profound at the end, man. That discipleship uh, yeah. isn't the end that citizenship is the end. I think most of our models thought discipleship was the end. Mm. And even some, some of our models even thought ministry was the end. Mm. You know, um, and, and as a result, I think it's, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but one thing that's kind of burdens my heart is seeing how many young people, uh, you know, talk about their calling is, is to become a minister. Mm. And I think what a shame because the high call of God I see is to become a citizen and patriot of the kingdom. The, 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 mini, the ministry you, you function in is, is simply a, it's a vehicle of service. And I think we're going back to what David said earlier, the challenges we face where these, uh, these the five, four minutes ministry in particular become titles. It's because the high calling has become the ministry rather than rather than the high calling being a citizen and a patriot and and some are some are called into in, in their citizenship and patriotism some are not even called into the apostolic or the prophetic offices but that doesn't stop them adding huge value to the kingdom because they're citizens um so i i, th I think that if we can if we can create uh, the systems and the services to support the development of citizens we will then see the leverage of Commonwealth amongst all of our communities, which I think we will then begin to see some really powerful patriotism uh, emerge from. Excellent, I'm done. All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. We're not going to bear on you any longer. Uh, we're going to, uh, David uh, Castro, if you have one quick uh, one quick thing to say before you go, we're way over time, but we want to hear from you, David. Uh, just one thought. The, the most beautiful thing about the kingdom is that uh, it allows everybody to be a vessel, a citizen that will bring his or her purpose within the kingdom to the spheres and the community. Some of the greatest kingdom men and women I know today don't stand on a pulpit. And that's all I wanna say. Excellent. What a, what a great way to end this session. Thank you all for your patience today and going over with us. We will continue some of this next week uh, and we're going to get the recording out to you uh, as soon as it becomes available. Also coupled with a 
uh, meet the creative core team and some information there that you may found, find helpful. So you'll find that in addition to uh, this recording. So thank you all very much. We'll talk to you next week. Thank, thank you. you all. Good night. Good thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye -bye. Take care now. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Uh, good, night. good night, everyone. Good night and good day. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.